Welcome to Philosophy 15. I'm Scott Aiken. And I'm Robert Talese. And this is a video cast. We're going to be uh, philosophy. We're talking about basic concepts in philosophy and argumentation theory logic. We're going to be talking about some standing debates in philosophy. We'll be talking about some issues in the, uh, the profession of philosophy. And we'll be talking about our own research. Um, what we'll be doing is trying to present the issues, uh, present the ideas, and we'll be arguing back and forth. Yeah, and the idea is to try to say something unscripted but substantive in 15 minutes or less for each episode. It's a little bit of a challenge to be able to do this in short order. We're academics, and so as a consequence, we like going on. But. <laughs> but. It's a good challenge, and uh, we might say brevity is the source of wit. Um, maybe it uh, would be better if it were the source of wisdom. <laughs> <laughs> well, it looks like wisdom often has to take long form, uh, long form versions. One of the things that we wanted to make sure to do is uh, really focus on uh, places where reason gets tripped up. Uh, and one of the things that we've been paying a lot of attention to in one of our recent co-authored books in, is uh, why we argue and how we should. Is the name of the book. That's right. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and. Uh, one of the focus of one of the foci of the book, one of the things that we focus on in the book, is um, why we care about good reasoning, why we care about good argument, and also places where it can be tripped up. And that doesn't just happen uh, whenever we're arguing about where to have dinner or what we want to do with the afternoon. It happens whenever we talk about politics. It happens when we talk about the things that matter most to us. Yeah, and everybody um, thinks of himself or herself that he or she is uh, a quite adept arguer, an impeccable reasoner, a uh, expert source of um, uh, good rationales for things. Um, and yet, everyone also thinks that most people are awful at these things. Yeah, it's a kind of a funny phenomenon that everyone's for critical thinking, but they're always talking about how critical thinking is something that the opposition needs to have, right? <laughs> it's so much easier to see the fallacies and the errors in those we oppose uh, than in on our own side. That's right. Even when philosophers talk about this very set of phenomena, the systematic tendency for people to overestimate their own virtue intellectually and their own adeptness at reasoning, even when we're making this very point, we are often accepting ourselves and the people with whom we agree. I mean, that's the, that's the very uh, uh, puzzling feature of this, is we think that we're all above board as reasoners. We think that most people are far below board as reasoners, but we are systematically, it seems, disinclined to diagnose failures of reasoning, bad argumentation, slippages in rationality, when we're dealing with the people with whom we agree substantively. Right. right. Sometimes this is called the belief error, that often if you think that the conclusion of an argument is true, you're willing to think it's a good argument regardless, even if the, even if the reasons are invalid or it doesn't look like you're justified in believing one of the premises. Uh, so one of the things that is really important about um, developing the skills of critical thinking and developing the capacity to be able to assess reasons in terms of how well they support something is that uh, we divorce whether or not we accept the conclusion or any of the premises from whether or not the premises actually support the conclusion. Uh, so these tools of logic, sometimes called the logical appraisal versus substantive or material appraisal, whether or not you think that the premises and conclusions are true or false, versus logical assessment, whether or not the premises uh, of the reasoning actually support the conclusion, that's something that you can do independently of whether or not you think that things are right, whether, you, whether or not you think that they're on the right path or whether or not they think they're, they're starting from the right place or ending up in the right place. And it turns out that that's actually a skill that requires a kind of pulling yourself up out of all the beliefs that you've got and looking at things kind of from a structural perspective. Right, which is not always easy and um, is the, the task largely of, you know, college level classes on logic or critical thinking. Uh, in fact, um, students are often 
um, puzzled at first to find, at least in formal logic classes, that uh, apart from maybe the first or second week, uh, everything instantly reverts up to or ascends up to just variables. Right? There are no longer actual natural language propositions that are involved in learning how to assess arguments. It's all P's and Q's and, and uh, A's and B's and C's and things. Um, there's a reason for that, uh, of the kind that Scott was just identifying. It's that the, when you're looking at the formal features of reasoning, it's important to clear away the kinds of messiness that um, accrues to natural language statements because we're subject to all kinds of foibles and biases when we know the content of the statements that it looks like we're not subject to when they're just variables standing in for statements whose content we don't or we're not attending to or we don't know. Um, now uh, it strikes me that uh, one of the things that we should also mention that we're interested in trying to um, address in this uh, series is um, the surprising to some, uh, um, the surprising depth and maybe the surprising number of connections that exist between um, the more or less sort of formal uh, or directed or careful study that philosophers do of argumentation and reasoning and man on the street, person on the street concerns about politics. That is, if uh, philosophers care about logic, both in its formal and informal aspects, because we care as human beings, as cognitive creatures, about reasoning well, it looks as if reasoning well uh, as an enterprise uh, takes on an even greater significance within political contexts, where how you reason, what you think, if you're 18 or over, what you think, 18 and over, not a convict, blah, 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 what you think matters politically and how you go about making up your mind matters politically. And what you think about political things, whether it's informed, well-informed, not informed at all, mistaken, uh, can have real impact on how other people, not just how you live your life, how other people live their lives. Right. And so this is especially important in democracies. Uh, because we all play the role of citizen, uh, we all have responsibilities of citizenship. And um, this, one of the things that, one of the ideas that uh, Rob and I share, uh, and Rob has convinced me of in the, the last handful of years, is that, uh, is that a deliberative conception of democracy is going to be the most workable one. And that seems less a surprise, uh, especially against the way that democracy has been thought about and been criticized in the past. So, for example, you go back to the end of uh, the end couple chapters chapters of Plato's Republic, books of Plato's Republic, uh, democracy looks like the worst kind of place where people are going to be able to exercise their critical thinking skills, be able to think things through. Uh, it looks like the way that politics works in a democracy, at least according to Plato's conception, uh, it's going to be a more assess pool uh, of uh, bad ideas and really just more uh, rhetoric. And one of the things that we have as a hope for democracy is that um, democracy is a place where ideas can be freely uh, expressed and can be freely criticized and we're not there's not an illusion of the freedom uh, that comes with expression that that means that you are immune to criticism so uh, the freedom of expression also comes with the requirements that you think critically about the things that people are saying uh, the proposals that people are making uh, and uh, be able to exchange well with each other right and here's one of the I think uh, places where um, uh, what looks like good uh, philosophical theory um, doesn't square so well with practice because, and maybe this is something else that we're interested in in, in trying to, to produce uh, uh, this series. Um, here's the puzzle, right? You might even say, here's our predicament. Um, in the past decade, democracy, democratic politics have become uh, increasingly deliberative, at least from the prima facie standpoint. Right. That is that it looks as if we no longer turn on our TVs at night to have Walter Cron Cronkite read a news story to us, and then he's done with that news story, and then the next news story comes up. It's almost impossible 
at least with visual media and auditory media, to hear just news reported. What often happens, what most frequently happens, is a host or a newscaster presents a story, something happened in the world today, or something happened in, uh, on Capitol Hill today, will tell you some version of what that event was, and then they'll turn to a panel. And the panel will feature people largely disagreeing, or, or of different, let's say, of different, it's not clear whether they're disagreeing. The panel will feature, you know, people will be, will be populated by individuals who have different views about the story that had just been presented. And the lion's share of the time is spent on the exchange. Yep. Now, uh, add to that, that our news is increasingly, even print news is increasingly consumed online, where everyone knows the real action, the real news consumption happens, not when the, not the part where the story is being written about, but in the comments feed. That's where everybody, that's where the action is, that's what people are doing. Now, when you think about it from the point of view of what Scott was just very quickly describing as a deliberative ideal of democracy, given not only the technological and communicative capabilities that we now have at our disposal, that everyone almost now has at his disposal or her disposal, given the actual practices where increasingly citizens are getting their news from these kinds of forums where there is no just purely just reportage, there is always reportage with discussion, with input, with participation, it looks as if, given the description we've just presented, we should be living in a deliberative Democrat's paradise. What we know, however, is that our politics have gotten, from the Democratic perspective, worse. And this is why we, why we think that, on the one hand, there's a regular call amongst philosophers in the philosophy profession, uh, among the American Philosophical Association, among American philosophers, uh, for more public philosophy. And we've been kind of curious as to what exactly that means. Um, but one of the things that we see in the comments section, in all these deliberative contexts of democracy, they're not just arguing about the facts, they're arguing about values. And this is a place where we think that philosophers can be of help. Because on the one hand, the tools of philosophy and the tools of critical thinking that we're, cur that we're interested in are ones that help us focus and to be able to assess good reasoning whenever we're talking not just about the thing where we're going to have dinner and whether or not something gives you gas. It's about the things that really matter the most important kinds of things in the world. And those are the kinds of places where people are more inclined to be able to fudge and be more inclined to say that there's good reasoning because they like the conclusions. But one of the good things about philosophy is that it'll, uh, that we're, that we show up to these debates, we show up to the reasoning with the hope that we can hold each other's feet to the fire with regards to what counts as a good reason. And so one of the hopes that we have with this is not just that this is going to be just an assessment of these formal techniques of looking at arguments. It's also going to be talking about how to be able to disagree about the things that matter most uh, in philosophy. And, and, and we'll see that in philosophy uh, because one of the one of the takeaways that you're going to see from so many of the, 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 the episodes that we'll have, have here is that there are no easy answers to hard questions. And it turns out that there are more hard questions than we've been anticipating. But so one of the things that we've kind of got planned out and one of the things that we're just going to see is that as we go along and as we exchange reasons about these, about hard questions, we're gonna see that every philosophical victory is, some, is in some way Pyrrhic. There's always going to be, and Pyrrhic, that just means that sometimes there, you're gonna win certain kinds of argumentative victories, but if you win too many of these victories, you'll lose the war because it turns out that every good philosophical view has costs, and being clear about those costs is a really important thing about just being intellectually honest. Yeah, we might even say, uh, just to get to the end of our first 15, 15, right? we might even say that that is one of the recurring lessons, we hope, of this series, is that um, at the end of the day, even when arguments look like uh, they are uh, going for what we might call sort of the absolute conclusion, you know, some statement is true, period, when we're talking about the things that matter most, the conclusion of every argument is always going to be a comparative, right? right. This is the best conclusion we've gotten thus far, 
and it's a mistake, we might even say. We might even say it's a collective, um, a widespread collective illusion that the most important questions have the simplest, obvious, quickest, most sloganizable, if that's a word, answers. <laughs> Uh, and that uh, the guy who coins the most memorable slogan in politics and democracy um, often is the one who's taken to have won the argument. But it would be ridiculous. <laughs> it's ridiculous to think that big, important questions about how we should live together and what we're allowed to force each other to do um, are questions that um, admit of obvious, simple, you know, uh, answers that wear their correctness on their sleeve in the form of a memorable slogan and a smiling face um, uh, asserting it. So, so that's Philosophy 15. Thank you.